Have you ever faced blackmail? As a rule, this method of influencing people is used by real assholes. My wife and I built an amazing life and were expecting our first child. Everything was fine until my wife's ex-boyfriend appeared in our lives and then everything went awry. De La Preacher sat up in bed, thinking about recent events. Glancing at the man sitting next to her, she smiled. Their relationship had been going on for two months and Will Conti had demonstrated his extraordinary intelligence and talent, surpassing all previous fans. Tonight she had discovered another dimension of him, his mastery of the bed. Dila lost track of the time when pleasure overwhelmed her senses. Their acquaintance began just over two months ago at her usual place. On Friday night, while partying at Murphy's Tavern with her work colleagues, Dela sought solace in drinking. It had been a busy week, which was compounded by the disappointment caused by the fact that George, with whom she had worked for a year, did not show up and did not answer her calls. To top it all off, George was not just a man. He was her immediate superior, and suspicions of his infidelity did not leave her. Across the bar, Will noticed the stunning blonde who wasn't accompanied by the man he'd seen her with before. He didn't believe they were in an exclusive relationship since she wasn't wearing a ring, and he had spotted the same man with a different woman at a club last week. Will wasn't one to interfere in someone else's relationship. But considering the circumstances, this seemed like the perfect opportunity to introduce himself. He requested the barmaid to send a round of drinks to the four ladies at the blonde's table. When the drinks arrived, Will approached to greet them. To Will's surprise, the blonde was just as attractive up close as she was from a distance. Moreover, she possessed a friendly, charming demeanor. Although it was obvious to everyone why Will was there, he had bought them all a drink and was smart enough to engage in conversation with each lady as much as with the one he was interested in. Consequently, the ladies gave him a pass and allowed him to stay. Will made sure not to linger too long, but he did manage to snag Dela's phone number before he left, hoping it was genuine as some women tend to give out fake numbers to shake off unwanted attention. Once Will departed from the tavern, all three women began advising Dela. They all agreed that Dela would be foolish not to agree to a date if and when Will asked. Phoebe was particularly insistent and, as always, injected humor into the situation. Girl, if you don't say yes when he calls, you just let me know. I've never dated a white guy before, but I'd make an exception for him. The other women chuckled because they knew Phoebe well. Her love and devotion to her husband, Jeffrey, were widely recognized. Later that week, Will phoned, and Dela agreed to his proposal for their inaugural date the following Saturday afternoon. Will escorted Dela to the Art Institute, a place she hadn't visited in at least five years, especially not in the company of someone well-versed in both classical and contemporary art. Will wasn't overtly showcasing his knowledge to impress Dela. Instead, it was a mutual exploration, revealing each other's preferences. By the time Will dropped Dela off at her apartment, they had already made plans for their next outing at Wrigley Field. During the game, Will admitted his lack of understanding of baseball, prompting Dela to educate him on its intricacies. This experience became Will's most enjoyable baseball game since he was 10 years old, when his father took him to Wrigley Field just before his father's unfortunate passing in an industrial accident. As the weeks passed, Dela found herself spending more of her leisure time with Will and less with George. By the end of the fourth week, Dela spent her final night in George's bed without any formal announcement. She simply ceased going out with George, who was preoccupied with other women and initially didn't notice the change. During the initial weeks, Will understood that Dela was still involved with someone else, as their relationship was new, and there were no expectations of exclusivity. However, by the end of the fourth week, Will observed that Dela was consistently available whenever he asked her out. Both Will and Dela refrained from discussing their past relationships during this time, each with their own reasons for avoiding the topic. It was evident of the times that they were both involved romantically and intimately with colleagues. Will had recently ended his relationship with Amanda Potter, one of the IT technicians in their office. During the initial two months of their courtship, Dela uncovered layers of Will's interests beyond just art. 
Will possessed an extensive CD collection spanning classical, country, rock, and jazz genres. On one occasion, they enjoyed an afternoon listening to the CSO in Grant Park. Will stood out as the kind of man who could delve into Dostoevsky in the morning and then efficiently tackle all the maintenance issues in her apartment, which the building superintendent never seemed to address. He even dedicated a Sunday to helping her father tune and repair his vintage Triumph TR4. That evening, a phone call from her parents emphasized their high regard for Will, considering him a keeper. Dela shared the sentiment, yet couldn't help but wonder why Will hadn't attempted to initiate intimacy. She silently wondered if this indicated some kind of flaw in Will, whether he was attractive, had physical limitations, or perhaps felt insecure about his abilities. Dela was determined to uncover the truth, but her opportunity never arose. The following Friday, Will surprised her by suggesting they dine at Le Colonial on Rush instead of their usual spot at a neighborhood tavern. Once their drinks were ordered and the waiter departed, Will broached the topic directly. You're probably wondering if I'm gay or something since I haven't made a move on you, right? Dela debated a white lie but knew honesty was key to progressing their relationship. She replied candidly. Yes, that thought crossed my mind, along with other possibilities like you not finding me attractive or desirable. Nothing could be further from the truth. You are undoubtedly the most attractive woman I've ever dated. Dela appreciated the compliment. All right, good to know, thank you. But does that mean we're circling back to the gay question? She aimed to keep the conversation light, yet secretly hoped for reassurance. No, I'm not gay. As Seinfeld famously said, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just hoping to dispel any misconceptions about my attraction to you or any concerns about performance issues. That crossed your mind too, didn't it? Dela responded with a smile, caught off guard, knowing her fears had been revealed without a word. Around this time, the waiter arrived with their drinks, and they requested a few more minutes before placing their dinner order. Once the waiter had agreed and departed, Will resumed speaking. Dela, I've waited until now for several reasons. Firstly, because I was aware of your involvement with your boss, although we haven't discussed it. I sense that relationship has ended. Secondly, I've developed strong feelings for you. It's only been a couple of months, but I'm deeply in love with you and I hope you feel the same. Lastly, I envision our first intimate moment as one of love not mere physicality. Before that happens, I want us to commit to being exclusive. No more dating, kissing, or being intimate with anyone else. I promise to uphold this commitment and expect the same respect from you. Will, I feel exactly the same way. Yes, I love you. Yes, I'm ready to take our relationship to the next level. You could very well be the man I spend my life with and start a family. But we need more time together before making such a lifelong commitment. I'm eager to spend that time with you to ensure our certainty. Lastly, you're correct. George and I ended our relationship over a month ago, although I haven't officially informed him yet. But I will. Very soon. Once they had resolved this issue, Will resisted the urge to skip dinner and head straight to his apartment. Instead, they refused dessert. Soon after the front door closed and they both found themselves without outerwear, Will took a step back to admire Dela's stunningly beautiful body. Taking Dela's hand, Will led her into the bedroom where they shared a moment for the first time. It was then that Dela realized that Will had nothing to hide. They looked into each other's eyes, kissed, and had a nice time together. Dela had hoped after those initial hours that this man would be the one she'd love for life. But now she faced a quandary. She enthusiastically agreed with Will that their relationship would be exclusive. He made it clear. If they were intimate, no one else could be involved, no other dates, and certainly no other partners. Dela was ecstatic that Will reciprocated her feelings. But here was the dilemma. For the past year, she had been dating her boss at the bank, George Tinker. 
As things became more serious with Will, Dela started avoiding George. Eventually, he noticed and began pressing her for an explanation as to why they hadn't been intimate for the past month. On Monday, Dela planned to end things with George, which would undoubtedly make her work situation very uncomfortable. It had seemed so straightforward over dinner. Dela fell asleep in Will's arms, after praying that everything would work out. But of course it didn't. When Dela uttered those words in George's office on Monday morning, she could see the fury in his eyes. George was a proud man. Women didn't break up with him, he broke up with them. The only thing that kept him from losing his temper and yelling at Dela was the knowledge that there were five employees on the other side of the closed office door who would hear him. Talk about saving face. George, driven by his inflated ego, responded by telling Dale that her feelings did not matter to him, since during their year-long relationship he had relationships with other women, and moreover, he criticized her bed habits. Daila left the office wondering why she had spent a whole year on such a despicable man. Meanwhile, Will and Daila's love continued to grow stronger, and they spent most of their evenings and weekends together, trying to please each other. Lying next to Will, she asked him, How did you become such an amazing lover? Will chuckled until he noticed the seriousness in her eyes. By now he was familiar enough with Dela to recognize that this was a genuine inquiry, and she harbored some apprehension about the answer. Will restrained himself from treating her question lightly. Before I answer, could you tell me why you're asking? I'm almost afraid of what you might say. You either have a history with many women or some sort of seductress. Either way, I feel like I'm up against tough competition. Will struggled even harder not to burst into laughter. Dela, you're incomparable. I'm holding back laughter because I've had similar thoughts about your past. I can't help but wonder where you picked up some of your skills. Did a former lover teach you the Kama Sutra? Please tell me it wasn't George. Oh, God, no. Let's not go there, but trust me when I say George couldn't satisfy a blow-up doll. You're avoiding the question. How do you know how to make love the way you do? The bright, full moon streamed in through the window, illuminating Dela's stunning blue eyes and causing her blonde hair to shimmer. It marked a pivotal moment in their relationship, and Will was resolute in facing it with complete honesty. I was incredibly fortunate. During my final year at university, I entered into a romantic relationship with one of my professors. Though it wasn't a love affair, there was a passionate fondness between us. She was quite vocal about guiding me and satisfying her desires. The affair lasted until my graduation day, when she abruptly ended it. As a parting gift, she gave me a round-trip ticket to Europe, a URL pass, and a lonely planet guidebook urging me to enjoy myself and let go of any attachment to us. She was aware of my growing feelings for her, feelings she had no intention of returning. I spent five weeks traveling through Europe, the first two weeks filled with melancholy as I wandered through Paris, the city of love. The following two weeks were spent with a group of Australians exploring southern France and northern Italy. My final week was enjoyed on Ibiza with an Italian co-ed. Returning to the States, I carried with me a profound gratitude for the wisdom my professor had shared. Dela continued to playfully provoke Will. As they settled in for the session, she remarked, If you happen to see your professor, please convey my thanks, but remember our arrangement. We're exclusive. Let's leave the past in the past. As Will relaxed, Ayla interjected, When did you feel like you became a man? Will was taken aback. Was she really asking this now? It's quite a cliché. It happened with a girl I dated in high school after our prom. Neither of us had been with anyone before, or so she claimed, though I had my doubts. But in the end, it didn't really matter. What mattered was that I achieved it before graduation. Was getting someone into bed your primary goal in high school? Yes, and it wasn't my first attempt. When I was in my senior year, John Meyer and I worked as busboys at a deli. We both decided that we didn't want to graduate until we had some fun with the girls, but we didn't have any prospects. 
so we decided to go to a place where we can get what we need for money. The problem was that we didn't know where to find them. So we asked the dishwasher. He gave us an address near Comiskey Park on the south side. John and I took the train to 47th Street, but as soon as we got out, five or six children chased us. It was clear that we were out of place in their neighborhood. We were terrified, but we managed to run into the tavern right in front of them. The expression on the faces of the people in the tavern when two white children burst into it screaming for help. I will never forget this moment. Fortunately, instead of kicking us out, the bartender called the police. They escorted us back to the train heading north where we belonged. Dila remained calm throughout his story, but Will was in a good mood. What did you tell the authorities? Did you explain why you were there? No way. We told them the story that we had misinterpreted the Sox schedule intending to attend the game, but mistakenly got off at the wrong stop. This incident made me reconsider the issue of paying for intimacy. I stayed a virgin until prom. Will's movements indicated his desire, and Dila understood it. When they were reunited, it was Will's turn to ask questions. What about you, Miss Pritchard? Share with me your first bed experience and all your adventures. Caleb burst out laughing. You'll probably be surprised to find out that you're dating Chicago's biggest prude. I've only been close to four men in my entire life. Kayla chuckled again when she saw Will's reaction. The initial person, more accurately a young man, was a basketball player I was in a relationship with for two years during my time at university. Yes, I was a 20-year-old second-year student when Jason Jerry was my first partner. We had been together for nearly six months when it occurred, after a night of consuming inexpensive wine. He didn't exploit me. Rather, the wine relaxed me enough to initiate intimacy with him. He always behaved like a gentleman and wouldn't have harmed me intentionally. I likely would have married Jason, but he passed away due to a congenital heart condition. It was incomprehensible to many how a college athlete could have such a condition. He was in such fantastic physical shape, always engaged in sports and activities. Will noticed tears welling up in Dela's eyes and gently squeezed her shoulders. I apologize for bringing it up. You don't have to continue if you don't want to. No, I'll be all right. I acknowledge that it still hurts when I think about Jason. He was such a good person, and I truly loved him. Dela leaned towards the nightstand and took hold of a tissue. Dabbing at her eyes, she then blew her nose with little regard for decorum. Rising from the bed, she strolled unclothed into the bathroom, disposed of the tissue in the toilet, flushed, and returned to bed. Throughout, Will observed her graceful movements attentively. All right, on to the next story. That involves Jason's teammate, Tommy Rawlings. About a year after Jason passed away, Tommy and I started seeing each other. The guys on Jason's team were always supportive, especially after his death. None of them ever crossed any lines, but Tommy and I gradually developed a connection and began going out just the two of us. A month later, I found myself in Tommy's bed. Will recognized Tommy Rawlings from his basketball career, which ended due to a knee injury after two years in the NBA. Standing at 6'8 with a deep complexion, Rawlings' presence stirred up unease in Will. Dela caught on to his apprehension and flashed a reassuring smile. I understand what's on your mind. My friends often say that all you men are alike. But to be fair, women aren't much different. I can't count how many of my friends were curious about what it would be like to be with Tommy. Everyone assumes he's just as well endowed as he is in other aspects. Poor Tommy. The stereotype about the size of black men is only that. A stereotype if Tommy is anything to go by. Let's just say Tommy is very average in that department. Let's change the subject, Will interjected with a quiet sigh of relief. What happened between you two? It was his mother. She was quite prejudiced. She didn't want Tommy dating a white girl, especially after he signed his pro contract. She thought I was after his money, which was ironic because she was the one who drained him when he only lasted a couple of years in the NBA.
You could spot her in the stands covered in jewelry, yelling at the referees during the rare occasions he played. Apologies again. So I'm guessing that leaves George. Yes, George, what a mistake that was. Shortly after I was promoted to senior cashier, George began courting me. It was not a compulsion I voluntarily entered into this relationship. He came from a wealthy family and had a certain charm. At 25, I hadn't had a serious relationship in years, and I was impressionable. I'm so glad that's over, Dela sighed, her voice tinged with relief. That guy's ego is just too much to handle. He couldn't wait to boast about all his other women once I ended things. And now, it's likely going to impact my future at the bank. Looks like I'll have to start considering other career options. Dela's concerns from that day soon materialized. When the next managerial position opened up, she was overlooked. The person who got the promotion was barely qualified, lacking Dela's education and credentials. Despite the challenges at work, Dela's personal life was thriving. She and Will had some minor disagreements, but those were insignificant compared to their shared values, aspirations, and dreams. They gradually became each other's closest confidants. Friends and family even dubbed them soulmates, a sentiment neither of them could dispute. In the spring, Dela persuaded Will to join her co-ed softball team, which tested their friendship. Previously, she had seen his skills in flag football, where he could throw a football over 50 yards accurately, and in winter basketball leagues, where he excelled in draining three-pointers. It puzzled Dela how someone so talented in football and basketball could struggle in baseball. Despite this, the team assigned Will to right field and placed him ninth in the batting order, while Dela took on pitching and cleanup duties. She was impressed by Will's ability to accept his role gracefully. Although Will had some ego, evidenced by his actions after striking out three times one night, he ensured Dela's satisfaction intimately. He believed sometimes a man has to do what he must. During subsequent games, Dela secretly hoped for more strikeouts whenever Will was at bat. On the first anniversary of their meeting, Will proposed to Dela, and she accepted. They planned their wedding for December, giving them just six months to prepare. While the proposal wasn't unexpected, Will's next announcement caught Dela off guard. I've been offered a promotion that requires me to transfer to the Milwaukee office, he said. It's not a major promotion, but it's a step up. I wanted to discuss it with you first before accepting. Dela was excited about the news. Take the promotion. It's time for me to find another job, too. I'll reach out to a headhunter in Milwaukee and start looking. Hopefully, I'll have something lined up before the wedding. She did find a job at a local startup, First Business Bank, in Milwaukee. It was a lateral move in terms of position and pay, but the lower cost of living in Wisconsin made it worthwhile. Dela moved into Will's condo immediately, with the wedding just three months away. The ceremony was beautiful, and Will couldn't contain his joy as Dela walked down the aisle in her stunning gown. As Mr. Pritchard placed Dela's hand in Will's, he looked at him and said, Take good care of my little girl. Will replied earnestly, I intend to. Three years later, Dela had become the assistant manager and was expecting their first child. She took a three-month leave when Billy William Jr. was born. Working for the bank owners, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson was a pleasure. Dela's team efficiently handled tasks and ensured customer satisfaction while the Johnsons fostered a family-friendly work atmosphere. Shortly after Billy's birth, Will and Dela sold their condo and purchased a house. Life seemed blissful, until it wasn't. Dela was stunned when Mr. Johnson gathered the staff for a meeting and revealed that the bank had been acquired by a large national bank based in North Carolina. In 2009, amid economic downturn, smaller banks nationwide were either shuttering or being absorbed by larger institutions. While the sale of First Business Bank wasn't unexpected, the surprise came with the introduction of the new executive vice president, overseeing retail banking in Wisconsin for the acquiring bank, George Tinker. That evening, upon returning home, Will sensed immediately that something occupied his wife's thoughts. After freshening up and planting a kiss on their six-month-old son, he joined her for dinner. 
Despite Dela having a glass of wine, which ruled out the possibility of her being pregnant as she abstained from alcohol during pregnancy, an air of tension lingered as they ate in silence for a brief few minutes. Eventually, Dela broke the silence with those ominous words, We need to talk. Could any semblance of good news follow such a foreboding phrase from one's beloved spouse? Dela proceeded to disclose news regarding her new boss to Will. Although Dela and George wouldn't share the same workspace, the hierarchical structure implied they would likely spend extensive time together in meetings, either with other managers present or, worse yet, in one-on-one -on -one sessions concerning her or her staff's performance. Despite the sensitive nature of their situation, Dela and Will managed to keep their conversation calm. They carefully deliberated their options, only to realize that they were severely limited. Having recently purchased their home, they had stretched their budget to secure a property in a neighborhood with reputable schools and ample space for their expanding family. Unfortunately, like many others, they had bought at the peak of the housing market and within a year, their home had depreciated in value. While their situation wasn't as dire as some, with only a 25% loss in value, their mortgage still exceeded the current market value of their home despite their substantial down payment. With moving out of the question, Will suggested exploring the possibility of Dela finding a new job. However, given the ongoing financial crisis and the surplus of unemployed bankers, Dela's chances of securing a position at her current salary were slim. Feeling trapped, Will held his wife close that night, grappling with the weight of their predicament. He couldn't shake the feeling of failure knowing that their current income wouldn't sustain them. With a heavy heart, he contemplated the prospect of Dela returning to work for a former lover, questioning his own strength and confidence to navigate the challenges ahead without letting it strain their marriage. For the first three months, it seemed that all their fears were groundless. George's relationship with Dela remained professional. He avoided any mention of their past relationship or its ending. However, all good things come to an end. One day, George invited Dale to have lunch with him, a routine business meeting between an employee and their manager. At first, everything seemed normal, but over dessert and coffee, George touched on another topic. You know, I still couldn't come to terms with the fact that you broke up with me, especially because of a person with a lower status. Dela was stunned by George's remark. It came out of the blue and hit her like a bullet. George, what are you implying? First of all, I don't approve of you insulting my husband or using derogatory language. Secondly, you admitted yourself that you had relationships with other women while we were together. Given your passivity, our relationship has lasted longer than it should. To put it mildly, George continued, Listen, you. Get ready to end up in my bed and beg for it. Otherwise, the photos of you that I have will end up with your unsuspecting husband and other people. Moreover, if you don't succeed in our meetings, your future performance evaluations will suffer. Dela was in disbelief as she heard the news, feeling the room start to spin and struggling to catch her breath. It was the first she had heard about the photos. Before George could finish his demands, Dela hastily rose from her seat and hurried to the bathroom, where she became sick. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she moved to the sink to wash her face and rinse her mouth. When she returned to the table, George was nowhere to be found. Her phone began to ring and without checking the caller ID, she answered it. I expected you to be more enthusiastic about reconnecting. Nevertheless, you have until the end of the week to decide, and you'd better choose wisely. Dela didn't return to work that afternoon. Instead, she went home and spent hours in the living room, trying to comprehend how her life had suddenly been turned upside down much like their mortgage and what she could do to set things right again. Normally, she would have picked up their son Billy from daycare, but she called Will at his office and asked him to do it, claiming she needed some rest. When Will and Billy returned home, Dela still hadn't reached any decisions. The evening dragged on, and after Will tucked their son into bed, he sat down with Dela at the kitchen table. Listening quietly, Will absorbed Dela's account of George's demands and threats. 
Though he remained silent, Dela sensed his simmering anger as his fists clenched and his face contorted in pain. Unseen to her, Will's mind raced with thoughts of murder, tempered only by the realization that such an act would devastate his family and rob him of watching his son grow up. After Dela finished, Will finally spoke. I'm going to talk to Ron Wallace across the street. Try to keep calm until I return. Ron might have some suggestions on how to handle this without risking my freedom. Dela found Will's last statement dense. The idea of prison hadn't crossed her mind until he mentioned it. As he stepped out, she broke down in tears for the umpteenth time that day. Ron Wallace, a detective at the county sheriff's office, had a cordial relationship with Will since the Conti family moved into the neighborhood. About a year ago, Ron and his wife Sally were the first to extend greetings and welcome to them. Additionally, their daughter served as Billy's babysitter. When Will knocked on the door, Sally warmly welcomed him with a hug. Will expressed his apology for the sudden visit and inquired if Ron was present, just as Ron entered the room and offered Will a beer, which he declined. Will proceeded to explain his reason for the visit. Before he could finish, Sally exclaimed, that poor dear, and rushed out the door towards the Conti's house. After listening to Will's account, Ron asked a few questions and pondered the best course of action. However, he wanted to confer with Dela first. The two men proceeded to Will's house, where they found Dela and Sally engaged in conversation in the living room. Sally had already reassured Dela, promising her that Ron would prevent Will from doing anything foolish and would offer constructive ideas to assist Dela in dealing with her boss. The following morning, Dela went to work, attempting to act normal as Ron had suggested. Meanwhile, Ron and Will proceeded to the district attorney's office, where Ron introduced Will to the DA, Donna Carson. Donna, a tall and robust woman, noticed Will's surprise and chuckled. Not what you were expecting, Mr. Conti. Will felt immediately embarrassed. Don't worry, Mr. Conti. I'm accustomed to people being taken aback. Every TV cop show depicts a slender lady DA. People anticipate someone like Angie Harmon. All 115 pounds of her. But instead, they get Ms. Amazon here. Her demeanor eased his discomfort and Will greeted her warmly as they shook hands. Now, Ron, tell me what brings you here this morning. Ron opened his notebook and recounted all the information he had gathered from Dela. He also explained why Dela wasn't present for the meeting. Smart move, Ron. I'll visit Ms. Conti at their home tonight. Do you believe she'll cooperate in getting Mr. Tinker recorded? She'll be apprehensive, but I've seen you handle such cases before. I trust you'll prepare her well. Besides, I've known Ms. Conti for a year now, and my wife and I believe she's a resilient woman. She'll be fine. Ron glanced at Will. You can understand that many harassed women withdraw before we secure a conviction, either when we attempt to have them wear a wire or during trial. Ms. Carson excels in helping these women overcome their fears. Mr. Conti, I'll come to your residence at seven if that suits you and Ms. Conti. I'll discuss our plan with you and your wife. Ron, can you make it? With Ms. Conti's consent, we'll have her attempt to record Mr. Tinker. It will aid in our prosecution and any subsequent lawsuits she may file against Mr. Tinker in the bank. Do you have legal representation? We haven't even broached that topic. I've only focused on assisting my wife in removing this jerk from her life. Ron, give Mr. Conti the name of the fiercest lawyer around. I believe you know who I mean. Donna Carson directed these words to Ron while jotting down the initials TJ on a legal pad on the desk. Will struggled to suppress a smile as Ms. Carson tore the page from the pad and shredded it behind her chair. On that very day, Will and Dela managed to secure a late afternoon meeting with Thomas Johansson. Johansson was strictly professional. He posed two questions while Dela recounted the lunch discussion, then got straight to the point. I'll assume you're being completely truthful, but if not, speak up now. Dela simply nodded in agreement. Good. Here's my proposal. We'll file lawsuits against both Tinker and the bank. The moment Tinker is apprehended, which I believe is the direction the DA is headed, we'll freeze Tinker's assets to prevent him from dissipating them. 
His legal expenses will soar and we aim to hinder him from depleting his resources. Will suddenly became apprehensive about the direction of this plan. Mr. Johansson, we don't have much extra money. You're suggesting two lawsuits, that sounds costly. Especially if the bank decides to contest. What if we don't win? Firstly, you won't have any upfront costs. I propose a fee of 40% of whatever compensation you receive, but I'll handle all expenses in exchange for this percentage. For example, if a court awards you 2 million but you only receive 1 million, I'll take 400,000. Secondly, your case against Tinker seems strong. The main concern is the amount of compensation you'll get. Though there's a chance Tinker might not have enough assets to cover it, I'm skeptical. Thirdly, I suspect Tinker has a history of harassment. These types typically have multiple victims. My expenses will come from investigating these incidents to establish a pattern, which will push the bank to settle. Keep in mind, we could take this to trial and potentially win a substantial sum, but it would mean enduring a lengthy legal process with depositions and the possibility of appeals, likely taking at least a year. Our best option is to demonstrate the harassment pattern and settle with the bank outside of court. Ultimately, the decision will be yours. I'll leave you two to discuss further. With that, Johansson exited the room. Will and Dela exchanged glances before Dela broke the silence. What's your opinion? Will responded, I have a good feeling about him, although I can't quite pinpoint why. Plus, he comes recommended by the DA, and I have a feeling you'll get along with her when you meet her tonight. If Johansson is open to letting us have the final say, and he's covering the costs, I say we go with him. What do you think? Let's request the paperwork and review it thoroughly. If everything checks out, I'm on board. Thomas Johansson's smile brightened as Dela relayed their decision. Since they needed to be home to meet with Ms. Carson, Johansson assured them that the paperwork would be sent over by messenger that evening. Will was correct. Dela found herself drawn to Donna Carson and felt at ease as the DA explained her plans. Carson was glad that the Contis had already consulted with a lawyer. Things are going to move quickly. If everything goes as planned, Mr. Tinker will be spending the weekend in jail. I don't know Tinker personally, but if you ever feel threatened, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Here's my cell number. It takes bravery to do what you're about to do. I appreciate that because I want these predators off the streets and I need your assistance to achieve it. With their arrangements settled, Donna Carson departed from the Conti residence just as the courier arrived to deliver the lawyer's documents. It took them another hour to review and sign the contract. Will would drop it off at Johansson's office first thing in the morning. It had been a long taxing day. Dela lay in bed nestled in Will's embrace, her head resting on his chest. Deep down they both desired intimacy, but exhaustion weighed heavily upon them. Just before drifting off to sleep, Dela softly murmured, I love you, Mr. Conti. Oh, how he cherished this woman. I love you too, Mrs. Conti. Dela phoned and confirmed plans to meet George for lunch on Friday. Despite her usual modest attire at work, Donna Carson advised her to dress even more conservatively that day. It was a common tactic for defense attorneys to shift blame onto the victim in harassment cases. If the matter went to trial, Ms. Carson would request Dela to wear the same outfit when testifying. During the initial 20 minutes of lunch, George was charming, reminiscent of the qualities that had initially attracted Dela to him. Dela declined any alcoholic beverages, keen on maintaining her clarity of mind. Her unease was justified. Midway through the meal, George abruptly seized Dela's purse and began rifling through its contents despite her protests. He retrieved a hidden digital recorder and turned it off with a sinister grin. Dela, you foolish woman, did you truly believe I wouldn't check for any traps? Dela sat frozen, her fork suspended in the air without uttering a word. Allow me to outline what comes next. Your little stunt has thoroughly angered me, and you'll face greater consequences for your foolishness. Here's where you'll find me. 
he passed her a piece of paper. Fabricate a plausible excuse for your sorry excuse of a husband and arrive at six. Don't bother with dressing provocatively. I'll provide an outfit upon your arrival. Expect not to return until well past midnight, so your alibi for your future cuckold must be convincing. Dela struggled to contain her reaction. When did this man become so malicious? What if I don't show up? I have already stressed how much my marriage means to me. Why would I risk my family for you? Because if you refuse, I can assure you that it will bring huge trouble. I have videos of our meetings. They will be posted on the internet, and copies will be sent to your family, colleagues, and, in particular, your beloved Will. There are no timestamps on any of the footage, and all the distinguishing features have been digitally altered to save me embarrassment. It is very convenient that you have changed so little in the last five years. No one will suspect that the videos are not new. Do yourself a favor and be at the specified location by six, otherwise the video will become public. Oh, one more thing. Since you attempted to record our little gathering, I'm considering inviting a friend to join us. You'll get along with him. Dela couldn't endure it any longer. She rose from the table and whispered, I hope you caught that. Unaware that the recorder hidden in the purse was a decoy, George remained oblivious. While real, Ms. Carson anticipated George might discover it, so the actual listening device was a sophisticated one concealed in the wire lining of Dela's bra. George settled the lunch bill and rose from his seat, wearing a broad smile. His expression shifted to a smirk as he contemplated betraying Dela's husband, then turned to concern as he faced two burly men and a stout woman, all displaying badges in their left hands. Mr. George Tinker, you are under arrest. While George was incarcerated over the weekend, Donna Carson secured a search warrant. It took the district attorney's computer expert 20 minutes to crack open George's PC and even less time to access the thumb drives that Tinker hadn't protected with passwords. Among the files were photos and videos of Dela, as well as footage of numerous other women. While some of these women were aware they were being filmed, most were not. Evidence suggested that at least two of these women had been previous victims of George's blackmail. Eventually, one of them agreed to testify at Tinker's trial. George's luck took a turn for the worse from this point onwards. He couldn't have deserved it more. Dela's lawyer managed to freeze George's assets during the lawsuit proceedings. With his assets inaccessible, George's prestigious law firm abandoned him, leaving him in a precarious position. This turn of events surprised no one. Both the civil and criminal cases against George were strong and the DA was determined not to let him off lightly. George's law firm could see the inevitable outcome and chose not to be associated with two losing cases, especially considering the possibility of having to handle both cases pro bono. George was left with a terrible legal representative. Will struggled to stifle laughter during the civil trial. Dela ended up winning a $2 million judgment. However, after George's assets were liquidated and her attorney took a 40% cut, Dela received just under a quarter of a million dollars. Despite this, she saw it as a stroke of luck, especially since the bank settled out of court, resulting in an additional 300000 for her. George was sentenced to a lengthy prison term. He was given a five-year sentence with no chance of parole until he had served at least three years. The district attorney ensured that the sentence would not be served in one of the more comfortable prisons. Six months post George's trial, Will and Dela found themselves unwinding in the Wallace's backyard, observing Ron grilling chicken and prawns on the BBQ. With Dela's belly swollen, they anticipated the arrival of twins in two months. Meanwhile, Billy was frolicking in the above ground pool with the Wallace's teenage daughter and her boyfriend. Aware of Will's notorious reputation for burning everything, nobody allowed him near the BBQ. Instead, he sat at the picnic table, savoring a liney long neck while gently caressing his wife's belly. Each kick from the twins brought him enduring joy. As the kitchen screen door creaked open, Sally emerged followed by Donna Carson and the most massive man Will had ever encountered in person. He bore resemblance to a former bear, William the Refrigerator Perry, 
although he was actually a nose tackle at the University of Texas, declining a professional career when offered a scholarship to Harvard Law School. Donna noticed Will's gaze and burst into laughter. Will Conti, meet my husband, David Carson. David, this is Will Conti and his charming wife, Dela. Will expected a hearty handshake from David, but was pleasantly surprised by the firmness of it. David then turned to Dela, taking her hand. Later, Dela described the sensation as if the big man held a delicate bird in his grasp. The three couples relaxed into an easy camaraderie, each relationship radiating with deep love and mutual respect. Despite this, there was a comfortable atmosphere that allowed for playful teasing. Their light-hearted banter paused briefly to discuss Dela's situation. While Sally and David were not privy to all the details, Sally made an insightful observation. You know what struck me the most? Besides Dela's resilience through all of this, it's how Will never once doubted her. It just goes to show how crucial trust is in a strong marriage. Shortly after, the atmosphere became more cheerful once more. The children exited the pool, dried themselves off, and joined the adults at the table. As the food was brought out and passed around, chicken and prawns, Will endured more teasing for not being proficient at grilling, labeled as not man enough. Dela affectionately kissed his cheek and discreetly caressed his thigh under the picnic table while resting her hand on her belly. It's okay, she chuckled. He's plenty man enough for me.